Got it. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Timothy J. Coleman, and I am with UA Road Sprinkler Fitter Local 669. And I just want to thank uh, Spendez for inviting me into the Washington School Counselors Association Professional Development webinar. And uh, I was very grateful to be out in Seattle at your conference and it was so good to be back after the pandemic so thank you for joining me uh, i want to start this afternoon off with a joke and i don't know if anybody's ever heard the story of the plumber and the doctor okay so a doctor has a plumbing issue it's a saturday night the doctor calls the plumber plumber shows up at the house goes upstairs fixes the problem comes downstairs hands the doctor the invoice or the bill and the doctor looks at this bill and the doctor says, oh my gosh, I've never made this much money before in my life. And the plumber looks at the doctor and she said, I didn't either when I was a doctor. So over the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is really drive home the point that you don't fail into construction. And I'm here to help you unlock the doors on union apprenticeship because I know it gets very confusing. But let's start off with another video because I want to catch everyone's attention that this opportunity that I'm going to talk about with the union building and construction trades is for everyone. I am a builder. I am a teacher. I am saving lives. I love what I do. I'm achieving my goals earning free college credits, securing my future, protecting the health and safety of our nation, working for great pay and benefit with incredible opportunities. I am in the best career, a career with a purpose, and I know I am making a difference. I am. I am. I am. I am building my future, and you can too. So, so let's kick it off and let's talk about building uh, the future of the young people that you have an opportunity to lead and mentor. So again, my name is Tim Coleman. I'm with Local 669 and we're going to talk about unlocking the door on union apprenticeships. So over the course of the next few minutes, we're going to get into some key terminology because you hear that a lot, you know, and you want to know what is an apprentice? What is a journey person? What is a registered apprenticeship program? I want to talk about the roots and why unions became strong, because I think it's important, especially in the year 2023, to understand our history and why we are relevant today. I want to talk about the building and construction trade structure, apprenticeship basics. What is an apprenticeship program? How does it work? What's the difference between a sheet metal workers apprenticeship program and a sprinkler fitters? And I want to talk about what unions offer. And of course, I want to get into the sprinkler fitter trade itself. So it's a specialized trade that many of you probably have never heard of. So it will be a brief introduction. And then I want to get into how do you apply? And that's really a common question is, okay, we know that trades are important today. Everyone's talking about it, but how do my students get in? So over the course of that conversation, we're going to talk about some resources that are available in Washington State that you can access that gives you exposure and awareness and a pathway into all the union building trades. So let's start off with just talking a little bit about the sprinkler fitter trade. We're not talking lawn sprinklers. We're talking the piping system. If you look in the in the bottom of the uh, of the slide, there's a sprinkler head. There's actually 2000 different types of sprinkler heads. 2,000 different types. We work with massive pumps, large piping systems is what we install. We'll work with Schedule 40 pipe, which is 8-inch pipe. In addition to water systems, and you think about typically the fire protection is water, uh, I want you to look off to your left and you see a data server center. So think about Google, Facebook, Instagram, but think about the banking industry or an airport or your school system. So imagine if we used water to suppress a fire in a server room. That would be like dropping your phone in the toilet, right? And there's not enough rice in Washington 
that's going to fix that data server center if we suppress the fire with water. So we use gases in some in some applications. So sprinkler fitters save lives, but we also save and protect assets. The photo to your right is a petrochemical facility. So if you remember, or if you are a school counselor in middle school, maybe you invite the fire department to come into your school to speak to your students and they give a class on fire extinguishers. And remember, a water fire extinguisher is only going to make a kitchen fire worse, right? Because it spreads out the oil and grease. So in the application with a petrochemical facility, we're going to use foam or CO2 systems to suppress that fire. So a lot of the growth in my industry right now is coming from the EV or the electric vehicle industry, where we are involved in building mega projects across the country and projects for electric vehicle lithium battery production facilities, right? These are big facilities, but you know what happens when you pour water or you put water on lithium? It blows up or it burns for days, right? So that's an application where we're using very sophisticated systems. Um, this is an example of a pump room. This is actually a, a Tesla Gigafactory, and that particular Gigafactory doubled the capacity of battery production in the entire world for electric vehicles. And we put in 225 different systems in that particular facility. So that's large pipe, right? It's not just that sprinkler head. And you can see how the pipe is connected, right? And we'll get into some um, um, GoPro and, and uh, drone videos. Here's another example of a pump room. So typically a sprinkler system is gonna work. This is a burn trailer, so there's a fire. There's a sprinkler head at the top of the building, right, on the ceiling, and there's a chemical reaction in that, in that chemical that causes expansion, the glass breaks, and the valve opens, and the valve opens and the water comes out, and the only folks that can turn that, that valve off is the fire department, right? The room on the right does not have sprinklers. It's not sprinkled, so it's going to continue to burn until the fire department shows up, right? So we save lives. Now, remember the fire that changed America, the Garment Triangle Sherways fire, where 146 teenage women died in 18 minutes? We are called the Iron Firefighters because we save lives. Here's an example of a About foam system. This is at NASA, where we are testing a very sophisticated system. 60 seconds for the foam to reach the wing of the aircraft. So this is a fire protection system. So in this case here, we're protecting not only people, but we're protecting assets. And this happens to be a multi-billion dollar asset uh, that uh, this hangar is housing uh, uh, space shuttles for NASA. In addition, um, and w let's get into uh, you know where we come in in the construction schedule. So this is, I'm going to fly the drone here. This is at a medical center. So typically sprinkler fitters on a construction schedule, because it's scheduled, you know, we can't all install our equipment or our process piping or, uh, you, you know, we can't put the walls up before certain uh, uh, materials are put in. We go in right before the sheet metal workers go in. So you can see the duct work is up and all this black pipe, this is all fire protection. Overhead, you see the pipe hangers that are hanging down, so we're installing those as well. All these pipes are connected, and off the, the headers are branch lines, and off those branch lines, you can see the sprinkler heads. Right, This is the type of work that we do, and you notice that it's overhead, so there's a lot of lifts, a lot of aerial lifts uh, that we're on, or we could be on ladders. Right, but Every single room in these buildings has to be protected. All right, in this case here, this is a hospital. And with a short period of time, uh, this facility at the University of Buffalo Medical Center, uh, we had all of our, uh, not only all of our trade was in and out doing our job at all the trades and they finished this particular um, construction project. Not only do we install, but we also test. So here's a fire pump test at Taiwanese Semiconductor heard about them, right? This is out in the uh, 
uh, desert in Arizona. The word trade is typically always on the clock. We're always working because not only do we install, but we test, inspect, and maintain. Speaking of Tesla, I want you to just understand the size and scope. We installed 96,000 sprinkler heads and over 25 miles of pipe in that particular facility. Right, so. This is a big, big trade when it comes to commercial work. Now, my local, local 669, we're a little different. Uh, we're what's called a road local. We actually have jurisdiction in 48 states. We've been around since 1915. We have 15,000 women and men. We have 52 training instructors that train in 40 locations across the country. And over the next two years, we're going to grow by 2,000 members. And that's because of the growth in the semiconductor industry, microchips, and also the electric vehicle industry, in addition to all the logistics and distribution centers and the school work uh, and the seismic work that we're doing with hospitals in the Pacific Northwest and the West Coast. So we're not in two states. We're not in Florida and we're not in Hawaii. And there are 13 major cities that we do not have jurisdiction. And in those 13 major cities, there's another sprinkler fitter local that has jurisdiction and they have been there longer than us. So as an example, in New York City, we have the great local 638 and that local has been around since the 1870s. We are local 669 in the Seattle market, down to Kelso as an example in that area, south to Kelso, there is local 699, and that is the sprinkler fitter local in that market. So we don't have uh, jurisdiction in the greater Seattle area. We have all of east of the Cascade Mountains. We have all of Oregon. Uh, we have a strong presence in the Tri-Cities, a strong presence in the Vancouver market as well, and then, of course, in Spokane in an eastern Washington state. Now here's where I want to talk about the structure. So you know a little bit about my local. My local is part of a bigger organization. So all locals in the building trades are part of a bigger organization. And I want you to think about this as your state chapter for ASCA is part of a bigger organization, right? And that's the National ASCA. And I want to put a plug in. If you have an opportunity to get to Atlanta this summer, please go. Uh, it will blow your mind with what the knowledge, the fellowship, uh, and the information that you're going to gather from the National ASCA Conference. I had the opportunity to be in Austin, Texas last summer, and I loved every single minute of it. So let's talk about my international, all right, my bigger organization. And my bigger organization is called the United Association. And what that stands for is the United Association of Journey Person and Apprentice Welders, Plumbers, Pipe Fitters, Steam Fitters, HVAC Refrigeration Techs, and Sprinkler Fitters, commonly called the UA. The UA has been around since 18. 73 has 359,000 members is in 300 locations across the country and is represented by 225 affiliate UA locals right now I'm not going to give you a test at the end of this presentation but I want you to just realize that a local union in your market is part of a bigger organization and in the pipe trades it's called the UA Local 669 happens to be the largest local in the UA, and a big part of that is because we have jurisdiction really across uh, the country. Now, the UA is part of an even bigger organization. So when you talk about unions and represented workers, the big organization is the AFL-CIO. Underneath that, you have the United Auto Workers, the Teachers Union, you have the Steel Workers, you have the Airline, uh, you have other large organizations at the national level. The building construction trades, it's called the North American Building Trades Union. There are 43 crafts or trades, 43. Most individuals, when I talk, go into a school and I talk to students, I say, well, let's build another school. Who's going to build it? And they say construction workers. And I say, well, what does a construction worker do? That's, that's the craft or trade. It's the specialty. So I want you to think about the profession of being a teacher, an educator. There are phys ed teachers. There are CTE teachers. 
there are language teachers, there are foreign language teachers, there are STEM teachers. Each has their own specialty. In the building trades, a craft or trade is a specialty. So that's when they talk about trades and crafts. It's a specialty. We all work together, but we all have a specialty. And our specialties, the 43, are represented by 15 internationals. Right. I mentioned that I'm part of the United Association. So let's talk about some of the others, because I think it's it's I think it's eye opening to see as oh my gosh, there's 43 pathways for my students, 43 places where they can go. Because not everyone's going to be a sprinkler fitter, but we all want them to find their truth and be represented workers so they have someone backing them up and they can make and earn a living wage. So typically one of the first trades on the ground is the operating engineers. Now the operating engineers, you can go a pathway to become a crane operator, that's a crafter trade, a heavy equipment like an excavator, but also surveyors. So there's three pathways right there. Did you know that the IBW, the electricians, have a, a trade that's low voltage where you work with telecom? or your outside wire, that's the transmission lines, maybe someone that works for a utility company. And then there's an inside electrician. The Teamsters is part of the North American building trades because they bring the product to and from the job site. The Union of Bricklayers and Allied Construction Workers and Craft Workers, right? An individual could be working with block, could be working with brick, they could be working with tile, right? An elevator constructor, that's a multi-craft trade. They're doing mechanical work, electrical work, fabrication work. Think about if you happen to be in Seattle, how many elevators are in Seattle, right? I know in New York City, Local One has just about 100% market share, and there's a lot of elevators in Manhattan. Uh, the painters and allied trades, you could be a painter, you could be doing wallpaper, you could be doing um, sheetrock, you could be a bridge painter, or you could be a glazer. A glazer works with glass. So think about how many buildings that you know that are going up where the facing is glass, right? So that's a trade that's continuing to grow. Layuna is the laborers union, 500,000 members nationwide, 500,000. The laborers are involved in every single aspect of the job site, every single one of them. There's a laborer that's there from start to finish. The plasters and cement masons. Smart is the sheet metal, rail and transportation workers. So you think about HVAC, the duct work as an example. Um, so they're doing that type of fabrication. We talked about the UA, which is the pipe trades. Remember the UA is plumbing, welding, pipe fitting, steam fitting, HVAC refrigeration techs and sprinkler fitters. Another trade is the roofers and waterproofers, which is a growing trader craft. Now, we're not talking shingles when we talk about a union roofer. We're talking about water reuse systems. We're talking about new types of material that are on commercial roofs that reduce net carbon zero, that reduce the carbon footprint, right? That help us to become sustainable. So all of us are on the cutting edge of green construction. The painters and allied trades, they're reusing material. You know, the bricklayers and masons, this is all reused material. The HVAC refrigeration techs uh, with the UA on the cutting edge of installing um, uh, heat pumps to reduce energy consumption. The boiler makers and the iron ship builders, the heat and frost insulators, that's the energy conservation specialist. So there's a trade that is wrapping piping, that is wrapping ductwork to reduce the loss of energy, which creates the opportunity to let use less energy. The iron workers, if you want to weld pipe, you join the UA. If you want to weld structurally, bridges and structural steel, then you join the iron workers. The iron workers have close to 200,000 members nationwide. The carpenters are not part of North American Building Trades Union, but I put them in there as well. And they're one of the 15 affiliates that we, that we talk about. Um, and the carpenters also have the millwrights that are working on state-of-the-art equipment. And they do a lot of traveling um, as well. So you're looking at over 3 million workers that make up the North American Building Trades. 
So that's the affiliate unions, right? And the trader craft is what we do, right? But it's not who we are. The DNA of unions is people. We're in the people business, just like you all are as educators and school counselors. You're in the people business, right? So where did we come from? And I think it's important to understand that because we balance between the contractor and the worker. We represent the blue collar worker. We're there to make sure that there's fairness. We focus on social justice. We focus on making sure that our workers are being treated fairly and being compensated fairly and have an opportunity to work in a safe environment. Common sense, right? Of course, that's the way we want to treat each other. But we didn't always, and still today, we still don't. So I think it's important to really just understand the roots because the roots of unions, and you all belong to unions, comes from the blood, sweat, and tears of our pioneers, right? That sacrifice themselves. So let's look at really uh, where the growth of unions came from. And this is the fire that changed America. This is where my trade came from. So let's talk about the Garment Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire was a man-made disaster, a tragedy of the industrial age, made all the worse because it could have been prevented. Let me set the scene. New York City, early 20th century. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory occupied several floors of a Manhattan business building called the Ash Building. It was located just off Washington Square Park, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the city. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was, by almost any definition, a sweatshop. It was a densely packed place. Some 500 people worked there, and the work schedule was punishing. 11 to 12 hours a day, every day. Most of the people employed at the factory were young immigrant women, teenagers even, who didn't speak English. These women sat at long tables, day in, day out, sewing shirtwaists. Shirtwaists were mass-produced blouses. They resembled men's shirts and were very popular with working women. So here's what happened. March 25th, 1911, Saturday evening, the end of the workday, the work week. A fire started in a bin of cotton scraps, perhaps from a cigarette butt. A manager tried to use a hose to put it out, but the hose valve was rusted shut and the hose itself was rotted away. The factory floor didn't have a sprinkler system, so the fire spread quickly. People panicked. The building had only one flimsy fire escape, and it wasn't nearly big enough. It collapsed. The building had four elevators, but only one was working, and it only held 12 people at a time. It managed to make four rescue trips before it broke down. Some desperate workers jumped to their deaths down the elevator shaft. Workers tried to take the stairs, but the exit doors only opened inward, and they were kept locked by factory management. Many people were crushed to death trying to get out. Firefighting technology hadn't caught up to the new tall buildings of a city like New York. The fire hoses and ladders could only reach the seventh floor, one floor short of the fire. Dozens of desperate workers jumped out of the windows. They chose to die from the fall instead of the flames. Other workers burned to death or died from smoke inhalation. The whole episode lasted just 18 minutes. 144 people were dead. Two more died later in the hospital bringing the death toll to 146. Until the events of September 11th, it was the deadliest workplace disaster in New York City history. Days later, on April 5th, a massive funeral protest march took place on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. More than 350,000 people were in attendance. 350,000 people, right? So here's, uh, here's a photo of uh, the day in the life in, in a mine. Right, so this was going on at the same time. So people decided enough was enough, that people were dying every single day in factories around the country. And the reason it was the fire that changed America wasn't the fire itself, it was the actions that happened afterwards. So that protest of 350,000 people was really the growth of labor unions in the United States. So they had existed prior to that, but not they grew after that. And one of the individuals that was part of that movement was a woman by the name of Miss Frances Perkins. And Miss Frances Perkins became the first woman 
to be in the United States cabinet. She held a position of Secretary of Labor for President Franklin Delano Roosevelt for 12 years. So with her work with the labor unions, things that we take for granted today, fire codes, child labor laws, right? So who died in that fire? Young teenage women, 12, 13, 14 years old. And the reason that they were working is because they were cheap labor. It was a sweatshop. Exits, uh, fire extinguishers. The Sullivan Huey Fire Act was passed in New York City at that time, right? So these are things that we take for granted. You just look around your classroom uh, in your school counseling center and you see pull stations for fire alarms. You see fire exit signs, right? We have things like OSHA today. And thanks to unions, we have things like the weekend. That fire occurred at the end of the work week on a Saturday night. Now think about your time when you were a child. Were you wanting to work in a sweatshop on a Saturday night? No, you wanted to actually be a, be a child, right? So these are things that we take for granted, right? So all these things, I think it's important really to remember. And a lot of students, they don't, they, they miss that. A lot of students today don't know what, where labor unions came from. They don't know what we represent, right? And they don't know how important it is, right? Because there are still workers in the United States today in certain industries, such as distribution, right? Such as um, food processing, right? That don't get breaks. Women have to wear diapers to work. This happens today in America, right? So we're there for social justice, fair work practices. We're there for safety. And that's really the biggest focus and in, in really where the start came from. But labor, trying but labor unions, in addition, we do other things. If anyone recognizes what these photos are, this is actually from an assembly line, right? So prior to the assembly line, you know, we're looking, we're talking Detroit here, we're talking some photos from automotive, there was specialization, right? And manufacturing got away at that time from apprenticeship, which is training and development of a workforce. The union building construction trades never gave up on that. We've been doing this for over a hundred years, right? So unions, in addition to protecting workers, we train and we train it better than anyone else. So let's talk about some terminology here and then let's talk about registered apprenticeship. So an apprenticeship is a combination of on the job training and technical instruction, it's both. So we're walking down the hallway into the chemistry department at your school. So we're, we're combining the two. It's technical instruction and on the job training. And it's America's best kept secret. But I wanna, before I get into more about apprenticeship, I wanna just talk about misused words today. And here's one, I, and I first started hearing this a little over 20 years ago, multitasking. And there's probably about 20, no, there's probably about 200 books that are written on multitasking right? The ability to do multiple things at the same time, right? And they're actually finding that it's very dangerous because the human brain can only function on one thing at a time. So the brain is focused and then it shuts off and then it starts something else again from scratch. So if multitasking was true, then texting and driving would be legal. And the reason it is illegal is the fact that you're either texting or driving. The brain can only focus on one thing at a time, right? So it's more about to us, to you and me, especially as school counselors, because you're fighting all these different things, is it's the power of engagement. If we can just get our students to engage and focus on one thing, right? So apprenticeship is like multitasking. It's a misused word today. It is butchered and it's misused, but a registered apprenticeship that's been around for over 100 years, and we go back to 1921 in Wisconsin, okay, and then we had the Perkins Act that was passed. It was a national act uh, which codified apprenticeship. So what is a registered apprenticeship? It's a collaboration between organized labor, the unions, contractors, the business owners, and we have training committees. In our career, Curriculum is registered at the federal and state level. So our curriculum is registered with L&I, Labor and Industries. 
just like your curriculum at your school is registered with your Board of Education and also the Department of Education. And there's standards. So our standard is to develop our apprentices who are in training into a subject matter expert and give them that gold standard. The gold standard for a high school student is to walk across that stage and when they graduate, they receive a diploma. Thank you very much for the diploma. It was a great four years here at the high school. So what does a registered apprenticeship in the union building trades do? The gold standard is being recognized as a journey person. That's a subject matter expert in a craft or trade that can work unsupervised and train apprentices. That's the definition journey level worker, journey person, subject matter expert. Now remember, there's 43 trades or crafts. Some are two year programs, some are three, some are four, some are five. It depends on the trade or craft. All the mechanicals, which is the UA, remember that's welding, plumbing, pipe fitting, HVAC, steam fitting, sprinkler fitters are all five year programs. The electricians are five year programs. Most are four, ours is five. So it works like this, you earn while you learn. This isn't an internship. You get paid from day one, right? We fight for that. We're not about free labor, right? A day's work, a day's pay. The job site is the classroom. So imagine, you know, imagine back in, imagine your favorite teacher when you went through school. Imagine if that teacher was with you on the job site, whatever path you went. Imagine how much you would learn. So that's what happens with the union building trades is the apprentice journey person model. That journey person is there to lead, develop, mentor, coach, and train the apprentices on the job site. That's the majority of it. Learning while doing, learning while using your hands, learning out in the field, work-based learning. We know that it works, right? Well, we've been doing this for over 100 years. We back it up with the technical instruction. Our trade has some virtual training, but we also have formalized classroom training. Remember I mentioned that we have 52 training instructors. We're in 40 locations across the country, right? We train in Spokane. We have a training center in Portland, Oregon. For those that are in, from Vancouver, they swing into there. Uh, UA Local 32, they have training centers in the Seattle market. Local 699 has their own training center in the Seattle market, right? The operating engineers have their own training center, right? So there's formalized classroom training, right? Because there's a lot that goes into this, right? But I want you to really just understand this, why we're America's best kept secret. Last year, in the year 2022, all 43 crafts or trades, the 15 affiliates, invested $2.55 billion in training and education, making us the largest education system in America. And we did that at no cost to the taxpayer. We're the only organization that the current membership pays forward for the future. And we're not just training apprentices, we're also training trainers. We're also training our journey level workers because technology changes, right? We're coming out with new types of systems. We're developing new programs such as uh, water purity programs, right? We had, we, we, unfortunately, we know about the Flint, Michigan water crisis, right? But there's also other major cities that have lead piping and President Biden, he passed the infrastructure bill uh, with the help of Senator Schumer Okay, and Congresswoman Pelosi, they put that together and it was a bipartisan package, right? Is that President Biden said, we want every single child, and President Obama talked about this as well, is every child to have safe drinking water, right? So there's different systems and different testing, and that's part of the training. We undergo that. We make an impact on the community, right? The new technology with water reuse systems for roofing systems, right? Some of that requires training. We train the trainer, right? We just don't go out and just, you know, grab the hammer and just go at it. It's highly skilled labor that we're talking about. So the program works like this. Uh, and this is, I'm talking specifically about the sprinkler fitters. 
um, and the others are similar. Is every six months, as you as a apprentice gains knowledge and work experience, they pick up rank. And when they pick up rank, they're like climbing a ladder to become a journey level worker. You get a promotion. It's about a five percent pay increase because that individual, that apprentice, has increased their knowledge and their work experience until they journey out. And once they journey out, they're recognized as a subject matter expert. That's the industry standard, journey level worker. In addition, because this is a registered program with a developed curriculum, a sprinkler fitter in all the UA, our apprentices, when they journey out, will earn 45 college credits, 45. Two classes short of a two-year degree in construction technology at no cost, no debt. America's best kept secret, right? We do this at no cost to the taxpayer, right? We train America's workforce, right? So that's the second thing that we do. Now let's, let's break this presentation up with a little trip back to, uh, to Hollywood here. One of my favorite movies of all time and scenes, Matrix One. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. Look how young he is. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Which one did he take? Took the red pill. Why? He wants the truth. Sometimes, and maybe you can mop what I'm spilling here, and you can identify. Sometimes we learn the truth by unlearning what we thought was true. And maybe you can relate to this. And maybe you even heard this. So here's an example. You ever hear this one? The only way to be successful is to get a white collar job and a four-year degree. Got to go to college. Got to go to college. Right? The trades are not for everybody, but college may not be for everyone either. Right? That's the blue pill. The red pill is you can be very successful without going to college. Now, one of the things that's really interesting is only 33% of Americans have college degrees. And there is a huge statistic that well over 50% that go on to a two-year school or community college never finish the first year. Right? So those are some scary numbers. There's also this phenomenon that higher education is completely afraid of. It's called summer melt. So Harvard did a study. Uh, this was a couple of years ago that depending on the high school, the summer melt, meaning those that say they're going to go to college never step foot on the college campus. So things like FAFSA, uh, all the immunization, or just, you know what, I just said I was going to college because I wanted to get, you know, the monkey off my back, right? Depending on the high school, some schools, and they used a case study in Dallas in the urban market, in an urban area, that 50% of those that said they were going to go to college never step foot. In white suburban districts, the report is 19%. This is coming from Harvard. So those are individuals that said they're going to go to college that never step foot. So what happens to them once they leave high school? They're gone, right? They're part of this society that people forget because they're not no longer being tracked, right? So we know that, right? We know that. And I know there's a lot of, lot of, uh, a lot of emphasis on that. But this presentation is about the red pill. And the red pill is you don't fail into construction. You don't fail into construction, right? There are 45 million Americans that currently carry a student loan debt. On average, that debt is $29,000. We're talking trillions of dollars of debt. 
right? We offer an opportunity for a college education and we are training and we are an education. We are educators. It is a curriculum that's skilled labor at no cost, 45 college credits, right? So we're all looking, you all, especially in the role and gosh, school counselors wear so many different hats, right? And career development, work-based learning and CTE and, you know, all the things that you do, right? So here's another pathway, right? Because we all want everyone to have a seat on the bus and have a pathway to success, right? But we know that there's these exit signs, drop out. You know, another exit sign that I'm really focused on is minimum wage, right? That's a detour. Minimum wage industries. The average age of minimum wage workers in America today is not a teenager. It's 35. 50% of women and people of color are employed in low-wage industries. So the union building trades has this bus that's going down the road, and we move fast, and we have seats on the bus that are open for everyone, right? And one of the reasons, and it's affecting your profession, it's affecting all the professions, is a phenomenon called the silver tsunami. Right. So baby boomers are exiting in the workforce. And just a little story, when I'm in a classroom and I ask the students, I said, tell me who the baby boomers are. And we work through that and they understand that it's a generation born after World War II and the bigger families at the time. And I said, what's happened to the baby boomers now? And they always there's always one person that says they're dying. And I'm like, whoa, not yet. We're exiting the workforce exiting the workforce 78 percent of the pipe trades almost eight out of ten of 359,000 members is over the age of 53. so what does that mean for the youth of today there's a window of about 10 years where they have more opportunity than any woman or man has had in the last four decades and we're one of those pathways right? And we have seats on the bus that's available. So we want our students to stay on the road to success, right? Even if they don't go into the military, even if they don't go into higher education, we want them to find employment that's sustainable. Now, you may say that, you know what, Tim, unions were important back in 1911. But think about the cost of housing today, the cost of food today. Think about the cost of healthcare today. Healthcare went up over 78%, right? And that's why President Obama made that his number one priority, right? So everything's gone up. And then here comes inflation because of the pandemic, the world shuts down. I don't even know what to put on that slide anymore, you know? The cost of living over the last 20 years has gone up over 30%. So the detour is the wages haven't kept pace for the most part. The top 10% of earners, the wages have gone up about 33% in the last 20 years. The top 50%, they've gone up about 14%. And the bottom 5%, the wages have actually gone flat or gone down. So why are unions important? We're important because of collective bargaining. And the reason that I gave you those numbers, 15,000 members, part of an organization, 359,000, part of an organization over 3 million, is numbers do matter. And numbers matter in collective bargaining because unions are like the beautiful redwood sequoia in, 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 down in California. These beautiful, beautiful trees these redwood trees, the most impressive thing I've ever seen in my life. Thousands of years old, 36 story buildings. This is what unions are like. And I use this core, I, I use this story because after I was out there and I saw these trees, I wanted to say, why, you know, they're around for a thousand years. And I did some research. Did you know that their root system only goes down five feet? I mean, look at all the, these, these young, individuals that are around the tree but the root system only goes down five feet there's actually a photo of a volkswagen bug that goes through the middle of them and that root system of that tree only goes down five feet 
So how do they withstand wind, storms for a thousand years? The root systems go out and they're intertwined. Each tree supports another tree. And that's really what unions do, right? It's strength in numbers, it's solidarity, right? We work together. So we work together to ensure that our members are earning a living wage. Right? So in, um, we're looking at Western uh, Washington, our wages start uh, at the end of the first year, our wages, an individual would be making $23.77 an hour. At the end of the second year, $28.27. All right, this is specific to sprinkler fitters. At the end of the third year, 3302. So this is the wage rate for 669, not for uh, not for 699. So 699 in Seattle has a different wage package. Every local has a different wage package. I can only talk about ours. At the end of the fourth year, 3777. At the end of the fifth year, remember it's a five-year program. And then when they journey out, our journey person in your market in Western Washington, right? In Vancouver and Portland, Kelso is $47 and 53 cents an hour in the check. Okay. That's a living wage. That's a living wage. So let's annualize that after the end of the first year, 49,441, right? The average income for a dual family house in the United States today is $50,000. So an apprentice after the first year is almost at that level. Year two, it raises to 58,801. Remember, every six months, there's a pay increase. Third year, 68,681. You know, on up to a journey level worker at $98,862, right? You don't fail into construction. This is the red pill, right? So the blue pill is, is that, you know what? If all else fails, you can try construction. Well, this is skilled labor, and we're paying our workforce because we collectively bargain for them with the contractors for a highly skilled workforce that they need to be paid appropriately. And they need to be paid appropriately because the cost of living has gone up. So what else do we offer? We offer benefits, right? Another exit or detour for working women and men and working persons today is not having benefits. And I'm talking medical, dental, vision, prescription, and eyeglass benefits. And we offer those. These are the Cadillac of benefits that the contractor pays for this. So what I share with you, that's the wage, that's what's in the check. The benefits are on top of that. And even more so, we fight for our members to have the opportunity to retire with dignity. How many how many that are on this webinar right now know somebody that's in their 70s that's working because they have to? I do. They can never retire, right? So we want our members to have the opportunity to retire with dignity. Now, there's a difference between working in your 70s because you want to and working because you have to. But what's better than one, one retirement? Two. Here's our first one. Okay. Our apprentices and our journey level workers will get $135 a month for every year they work. So if, if you work for 40 years, right, and you retire before you're, you know, 60 years old, right, 40 times 135, that's $5,400 a month. Multiply that by 10, 12 years, that's $64,800. So I first, I first started going out um, uh, to Oregon and Washington State. Uh, just a number of years ago, uh, before the pandemic, and that number was $115 a month. So that number is only going to go up. So if the life expectancy of a U.S. citizen is 80, 20 years of $64,800, that pension fund is worth close to $1.3 million. That's a red pill. You don't fail into construction. The second retirement is like a 401k. It's a CIS. The contractor will contribute $7.30 an hour into our member's fund. 730 times 40 hours in a week times 52, that's $15,184 a year. Multiply that by 40 years, that's 607000 Now, 
the difference here in in a classroom i'll go to the i'll go to the whiteboard and the smart board and i'll and i'll explain really quickly what is compounding interest the average compound interest rate over the last 30 years for retirement fund has been seven percent seven percent over 40 years of fifteen thousand dollars and 180 184 dollars that's three million dollars now I also give a quick little math or business uh, you know, class to show that what is the compounding interest rate of 30 years of that same amount? Well, it's no longer 3 million, it's down to $1.4 million, right? So compounding interest, time, and interest on money makes more money. But those are great numbers. A lot of people don't have retirement today, right? We have two. We have two, right? So strength in numbers, being a represented worker certainly works. Here's another way to look at this. In Western Washington, after four years, our apprentices will be at $78,561, have earned $250,000 without incurring any debt, and maybe their peers that went on to college haven't made a dime yet and are looking for a job. What, what, what can I do for you, Rob? I want to set Tell the me, scene. Jerry Maguire, sports agent, represents Rod. Rod is an all-pro receiver for the Seattle Seahawks. He's in a contract year. And what does he want? Here it is. Show me the wants the money. So these are our base rates. Western Washington base, 2139. Six months later, 2377. Journey rate, 4753. Eastern. Just tell me okay, east of the Cascades, Spokane, Tri Cities, 1847, class two, 2053, and the journey rate's 4105. So there is a difference in the numbers, but we're over $40 an hour uh, in that part of the state. Show me the money. It's more than the money, though, right? We're doing essential work. So I want you to just kind of close your eyes and think about how important you think a fire suppression system is in a nursing home or assisted living. How good do your students feel when they do a hands-on project, right? And that's what tradespeople do, right? At the end of the day, we have a sense of accomplishment. How important do you think it is for an HVAC refrigeration tech to be servicing an HVAC system in a school or in a hospital during the middle of an airborne pandemic called COVID-19. How important is that? Or how important it is for that refrigeration tech to be working on a train, working on a truck, a refrigerated vehicle, a refrigerated transportation vessel that is transporting a vaccine that had to be refrigerated. How important it is for the tradespeople to be installing solar farms so we can reduce the carbon footprint. How important it is for tradespeople to be working out at the Hannaford VIT plant out in Tri Cities, you know, to ensure that we have a method to dispose of uh, nuclear waste, right? To to take that through the process where uh, it's turned into glass. Uh, you know, and packaged and contained in some type of tomb where, where it can be properly stored. How important it is for us to develop um, chip plants, right? This is national security today. There is a race that's going on, right? And we're all part of that, right? But the bottom line is we're not going to, we're not going to be successful if those facilities don't get built, right? And how important it is for you know, you, you live along the Columbia River and you look at all those dams and think about the carpenters that are working there. Think about the millwrights. Think about the winders that are working on those turbines, right? We take for granted things like basic electricity, right? So we're doing worthwhile work, right? We are essential workers. My trade during the pandemic, we had one month where our unemployment rate went to 40%. The next month it was back to 60 Within three months, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were over 80% was employed and working. And then with like five, six months, we were back over 90%. Right? It's essential work. 
So I want to show just a video so you can see some of the size and scope of some of these projects because I think it's really, really breathtaking uh, and cool to see this. So this is down in Hillsboro, Oregon, outside of Beaverton. Uh, this is an expansion at the Intel chip plant, one of the first. This is out in Chandler, Arizona, which is in the Phoenix market. It's another Intel chip plant. Those are massive facilities. Um, we'll we'll put really in about 300 a, miles of pipe. Glimpse of the scale Here's inside one of those facilities, chip on manufacturing uh, in, inside and looking semiconductor at facility. And ever says Ohio's operation. All the automation that has to be installed. This is Ford Blue Oval City in Memphis. Ford Motor Company is building a new city that will manufacture all electric vehicles for Ford, battery Kentucky, recycling, and also two battery production. Two co-located battery plants in partnership with SK Innovation. This is a Tesla facility in Round Rock, Texas. So Local 669 was, is involved or was involved in every single one of these projects. And in Tesla, we still have, this was built Lately, it's in production. We still have about 40 sprinkler fitters that work at that site. This is a Micron facility uh, that's going into Syracuse, New York. Uh, we're doing also a Micron expansion in Boise. Well, Micron is now building another mega factory in central New York at a whopping 100 million. <coughs> Micron dollars makes chips for chip memory before systems. This New York factory comes one month after it announced plans for a new semiconductor fab. In Boise, Micron manufactures the chips that powers everything from smartphones to computers to automobiles. And these products used to be manufactured abroad, primarily in China, until Congress passed the $280 billion Chips and Science Act, which set aside $52 billion to bolster the semiconductor industry. Now, Micron announced in September that the new semiconductor plant will create 17,000 jobs. Here in Boise and New York may see up to 50,000 jobs. It's another fab. This is Wolf Speed, and they make chips for electric vehicles. Uh, we're doing a huge Wolf Speed expansion in Durham, North Carolina right now. It's just a DHL uh, logistics distribution center. A lot of, a lot of distribution and storage is coming back to the U.S. I mean, we understood what happened with our supply chain. Right? The whole just in time model. So there's a lot of growth in construction with uh, distribution and logistics, cold storage, food processing. So I want you to really focus on the size of the pipe. All right, you'll see the pipe and you'll see this is all fire protection in this part of this video here you have an opportunity just to see the piping systems and how um, intricate it is and the size of it i mean that's schedule 40 pipe and notice that he's up above right he's high in the air and this spring here is also on the lift right he's on an aerial lift so we do overhead work We thread a lot of pipe. The size of those fittings. This is all work being done in fire protection. All right? Remember, there's 43 trades or crafts. You know, the Ford F-150 assembly plant in Dearborn, Michigan, we put in uh, hundreds of miles of sprinkler fitter piping. We do stadiums as well. This is Little Caesars. This is where the Detroit Pistons play. Again, we're a road local jurisdiction. 
uh, all across the country. Massive distribution centers, Walmart, you think about Amazon. All right, so it's about helping our students really to find their truth. Right? And we offer, um, we offer the red pill, you know, that you don't fail into construction, that there are 43 crafts or trades. Because school isn't for everybody. I think I got caught up in it where society was like, college, 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 you have to go to college. If you want to be successful, you have to go to college. I'm $60,000 in debt, and I could have joined this trade out of high school and been debt free, earn while I learned. Uh, since I've become a union member is I'm a part of something bigger than myself. Um, you know, when you're non-union, you're, you're always concerned about where the next job is coming from, how you're gonna pay for your health care, retirement, your benefits. Everything is on your shoulders solely and completely. It's been a world of a difference between non-union and union, just in terms of work environment, um, the safety culture, it, and not to mention better pay with the union, the benefits package with the health care and the services that they offer. Well, as a minority in the labor union, there's no limit to what you can make. There's no limit to where you can go in the field. And it's not like there's a ceiling when you get in. It's like, all right, you start at the bottom. Now go up. So speaking of going up, right, there's a pathway that continues beyond journey person and journey level workers into becoming a supervisor, becoming a union school, official, becoming a superintendent. And each time you climb the ranks, there's an additional compensation and pay. Um, I want to talk really quickly, and I'm going to show just a short video here, that this opportunity is for everyone. And I've had an opportunity to meet a number of Rosies out in the Pacific Northwest that worked in the shipyards. Uh, we've had a 78% increase of women coming into the United Association, our international, over the last two years. If someone told me construction was a man's job, I would say what I have always said, which is absolutely not. Women can do anything a man can do. I can do anything a man can do. Anything that my brothers or my dad could do, I can do it. Just as well, as, if not better. It seems like there's more and more of us out there, and I think that it's awesome for women to work with their hands and, and use their minds in different ways. All across the nation, infrastructure, property, and lives are protected thanks to the work of well-trained and highly skilled sprinkler fitters. We're currently seeking motivated women from all backgrounds to join our apprenticeship program, learning the skills needed to start a rewarding career as a sprinkler fitter. Honestly, I thought it was sprinklers, like ground sprinklers. Oh, you mean like... Anna is no longer an apprentice. She journeyed out, is now the training proctor in Portland, Oregon. And she is also a supervisor for McKinstry Fire Protection. And she spends a lot of time uh, at the Intel facility and just loves to teach. Fire sprinklers. And they were like, yeah, it's an apprenticeship. So it's not just a job, it's a career. We'll train you to install. Jill is the owner, business owner of Century Fire Protection. And she has been a, so she's an owner member. And we have most of our contractors are our, our union members. And Jill has been in the trade for uh, close to 30 years. All and maintain fire protection systems, including commercial and industrial structures, power plants, hospitals, factories, and more. I think that a sprinkler fitter um, helps the firefighters out in the sense that um, we're kind of the first line of defense. It's a means of exiting safely if and when there happens to be a fire. This is challenging work, often done in the air on loud. Ashley Porter is in uh, upstate New York and, and Ashley is a 15 year member. When she was an apprentice, she won the apprenticeship contest. So we, the UA has an apprenticeship contest similar to like Skills USA. And Ashley took down uh, one New York State beat a welder from local one who's out of uh, local ones out of New York City 
uh, and then went on to uh, the eastern regions and finished number two. And she works for a pretty large uh, fire protection company uh, and does a lot of work in the service side of it. So she works as a troubleshooter on existing uh, fire protection systems and uses a lot of, uh, uh, you know, her problem solving skills. She graduated from State University of New York Environmental Science and Forestry uh, with a four year degree and, and really just was unsatisfied in her career path. Uh, and join the sprinkler fitter trade, as I mentioned, 15 years ago. Ladders or lifts. If this sounds like your type of career, there has never been a better time to consider an apprenticeship in the sprinkler fitting trade. So it's a five-year apprenticeship program. So here's Anna out in uh, Intel, just having some fun. My sister's having some fun out there. She sent me this little uh, video that she had posted on her uh, Instagram. Anna is part of our National Diversity Committee. This is Lydia. Lydia works for uh, Patriot Fire Protection out of Spokane and uh, is just, just doing an unbelievable job. Lydia graduated from uh, Skill Trades Prep, a uh, pre-apprenticeship program out of Spokane that's ran by uh, Spokane Community College. It's a uh, labor and industries approved. So let's talk about the process, right? So a process to get into uh, Local 669, uh, you've got to be 18. you got to have a high school diploma GD. You have to pass a drug test and a physical. Must be able, physically able to do the work and have to register. So the registration link is Training 669. And on that link, there's six videos, Women in Construction, Day in the Life. Um, so you register there. Um, if you have students that want to get in and they're in our jurisdiction, I'll walk them through the process and I'll show you my contact information at the end. In our trade, because we're a road local, the contractor does the interview and holds the list. So the interview is done at the contractor level instead of at the local, right? So it's a little bit different. We have what's called open enrollment meaning that we interview throughout the year based on the contractor's needs. So there's not that one little window that you have to wait until June as an example. So I'll help, uh, you know, individuals with interview prep. I'll, you know, and I'm doing that not to tell them what to say, but to make sure that they have an opportunity to showcase their skills and to add confidence to help them become the best version of themselves. We also have pathways for individuals that want to do multi-state travel. If someone wants to, has the maturity and wants to multi-state travel, like I've, 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 I've talked to a number of school districts that are down in uh, central Washington, you know, between Tri-Cities and Yakima as an example, and those communities, they're, they're travelers, right? And here's what we offer as travelers. We offer per diem, you know, 840 a week, we offer the mileage. We offer guaranteed 10 to 20 hours in overtime. These are large infrastructure projects. So this is traveling away from home. But you don't have to do that with us as well. If you're in the Vancouver market, Spokane, you know, if you're in the Tri-Cities, you have an opportunity to work in that area. Other trades, other locals, they have jurisdiction and their work is in a smaller geographic area. Remember, we're a wild card that's a little different because we're a road local. So how do you prepare? Um, I think, you know, having trade visits with your CTE programs, there's some tremendous schools that are out there. There are uh, pre-apprenticeship programs that to help maybe your students look at, you know, some of them are multi-craft core curriculum programs that is a program uh, through NAPTU in the Seattle market, the first pre-apprenticeship program in the country is also a pre-apprenticeship program that is specifically for women. Um, and that is alternative new employment for women. Uh, Spokane, as I mentioned, has skilled trades prep. It's a self, uh, 
funded program uh, that's sponsored by labor and industries. There's a program called Trades Future that's expanded a partnership between the Urban League and NAP2. So these are pre-apprenticeship programs. And I like them, you know, because it, it helps develop this, the, the soft skills, helps develop the mentality, helps, uh, you know, develop safety uh, behaviors, helps develop general workplace behaviors, such as having to punch in a clock on time, being on time every single day, you know, being responsible, having exposure to hand tools, you know, because the trades are hand-eye coordination, right? Having mechanical aptitude, and it's all about attitude, right? Just like anything else. Um, you know, there are a number of trade schools that are out there that I think are a great pathway, right? That prepare uh, and introduce and teach skills that are phenomenal. Uh, the military, there's 143 MOSs in the military. Right. So the trades, remember I mentioned there's 43 crafts or trades. Well, think about the militaries that have 143 crafts or trades. So they're teaching uh, life skills and skills that can, that can stay with that service member once they transition out of the military. You know, and, and everybody asks, you know, what can we teach? You know, what can we emphasize at, the, you know, at the high school level, the middle school level? You know, it's 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 the golden it's the golden nugget. You know, and and as I looked at the at the breakout sessions uh, at the Waska conference, you know, we're talking the same things. You know, we're talking about mental health. We're talking about confidence. We're talking about you know social skills. Soft skills are so important. Being on time, having a great attitude, having work ethic. It's hard work. You know, we're privatized unions that want our contractors to succeed. Apprenticeship is not about walking around with the clipboard and taking notes. You're learning by doing, right? And that journey level worker is throwing the ball, right, to an apprentice and they have to catch it, right? They have to do their job. They have to meet their expectations, right? And we coach and train over the five years, but things like showing up to work on time, those are, those are like, those are given. Right. And that's where it's OK. Once you enter the workforce, there are expectations just like you and I have. Right. Um, and that's like, yeah, we get it, Tim. We understand that. So it's continuing to work together to drive that home. Um, you know, travelers can live anywhere. I talked about that. So here's a great resource. The Washington Building Trades Council. You know, this is where you want to go to contact for. Uh, career nights for open houses, you know, on this website, as you open it up, um, you know, there is, um, you know, seven affiliated associations, uh, you know, the Washington State Building and Construction Trades, it consists of 47 affiliated local unions of so 47 separate unions in the state of Washington, represented by nine regional councils in different associations like the Washington State Pipe Trades as an example. But the regional councils is your go-to. That's the number that, hey, I wanna bring the trades into my high school, into my middle school. That's where you go. You know, you can contact me directly for the sprinkler fitter trade and I would love to participate, right? But this is really the, uh, you, you know, the site that you wanna go to. And I'm gonna come back to this because we're getting towards the end, and I want to open up that website. So I want to show you to help you navigate through that. Another great uh, resource is North American Building Trades Union, you know, which is, again, the big kahuna at the national level. It's a labor organization representing more than 3 million skilled craft professionals in the U.S. and Canada, comprised of 14 national and international unions and over 330 provincial, state, and local building and construction trade councils. So that's at the national level. There's resources for all. There's information on multi-craft core curriculum. There's math assessment and other tools. Okay, and I'm gonna go back to that because I, I don't wanna, uh, I'll go back to that site as well. So here's my contact information. Uh, this is on the recording. You know, that's my cell number, that's my email. Uh, you know, I, I'd love to participate in regional meetings with school counselors. And I want to go back to a couple of these sites here. 
uh, nap2.org. So we're going to go back WashingtonBuildingTrades.org. Okay. We're going to stop sharing really quick. And I want to open up a couple of these sites here. Because uh, I want you to see Okay, we're going to jump back in here. Okay, so here's the Washington Building Trades website, WashingtonBuildingTrades.org. And it breaks down the regional councils. It's really easy to use. Like if we're in um, central Washington, right, there's a point of contact. So they're out of Tri-Cities. They're out of Pasco, right? So this would be, all right, I want to get the trades. And, and then what they'll do is they'll send it out to all the trades. So remember, there's 43 crafts or trades, 15 affiliates in this area to get them to participate if you want to do like a, a trades fair, as an example. Um, so each, remember, there's a number of councils throughout the state. And it breaks down all the affiliated unions, affiliated associations. So here's one here. Washington State Association of Electrical Workers are based out of Kent, okay? I want to learn more about that particular trade. So that's good for resources. Um, you know, it breaks down apprenticeship and training. You know, how do we get into career exploration? Apprenticeship prep. Okay, so that's your state specific. So let's go to the North American Building Trades Union. And I want to show you this resource, which is on the slide. All right, so I want to go back and stop sharing. So this is NAP2. So NAP2, this is a great resource for you. All right, great resource. So it lists all the affiliates and it has a website for each. So you don't have to run around and look, how do I find information? I showed you incredible videos about the day in the life of a sprinkler fitter and women in construction that are sprinkler fitters. Every single one of these affiliates has something very similar. So you can learn about, okay, what are the crafts or trades in the bricklayers and allied craft workers? What does an elevator constructor do, right? And so on. Every single one of these trades, there's a website and there's a great resource. Okay, there's a great section on apprenticeship readiness programs. And I had mentioned um, MC3, right? So these are different pathways. There are teacher resources on here, apprenticeship brochures, recruitment videos, why teach MC3? Um, and we're in a number of school districts in the state of California, in Minnesota, in Ohio, in New York. You know, so there's a, where do you find an MC3 program? And this is a pre-apprenticeship program. Um, there is a ruler tape measure math quick lesson. There is a pipe trades prep math competency test, right? So that's some of us, like what kind of math? So I want to learn more about what the math requires. So here's like a prep test, you know, that your CTE program can go through you know, with the students. So there's great resources that are here. They're right there, right on that one website. Um, apprenticeship and training video gallery. You know, all one-stop shop. Uh, there's a video, uh, there's a link here that gets into Trades Women Build Nations. So every single year, there's about 3,500 women in all the building trades get together for a national conference. Last year was in Las Vegas. Okay, this year coming up, it's going to be in Washington, D.C. And there's a number of breakout sessions because women 
are making such a huge impact that women are in leadership roles that they should be in, right? They focus because there's something called wage equity in the union building trades where a woman apprentice is made the same as a man apprentice, right? So regardless of race, gender, orientation, identity, okay? Everyone is paid exactly the same as their counterpart, right? They may identify themselves separately, right? So TWBN has been on the leading force of equity, diversity, and inclusion in the union building trades for years. There's also a program that I'm excited about uh, with tradeswomen uh, is called Lean In Circles. So lean in circles is maybe you have a woman that is in a trade that doesn't have a lot of women representation in that particular market, but there are women that are sisters that are in other trades and these circles come together. So a sheet metal worker is supporting a woman that is an operating engineer that's supporting a woman that's a sprinkler fitter. Again, solidarity, you know, so these programs are designed to set up success. So that's the NAPTU site. Um, so I wanted to just kind of jump into that a little bit. Uh, so you had an opportunity to see the site as I navigate through that. Um, so we're kind of winding down at this point. I'm out of jokes. Um, I don't have any more videos to show you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, I love what I do. If I can be a resource for you, uh, I look forward to connecting with you, to helping you. Um, you know, we have needs constantly uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we're a growing trade. We're a great trade. Um, you know, but we're also part of a bigger organization uh, that I'm proud to be part of, and that's called the United Association. And the UA is part of an even bigger organization called the North American Building Trades Union. So I want to thank you, Lauren, for having me in. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be with you and your fellow school counselors at the WASCA conference a couple weeks ago in Seattle. Uh, and I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to create awareness and to unlock the doors for union apprenticeship. Thank you so much for your time and energy. Um, and I just have a great rest of uh, this year, 2023. And way to go. And thank you for all that you did during the pandemic. And I mean that because I know school counselors uh, wear so many different hats. And, you know, my, my, my heart goes out to you and all the hard work. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing such important and powerful information for our counselors. Like we shared, this video is going to be posted and up for counselors to be able to watch. If you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to me if you need contact information too, and we're happy to support you. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Can't wait.